<laughs> How's everybody doing? Ms. Boss, let the record show that you called this meeting to order at 1.33 p.m. on October the 23rd, this workshop. I now have a quorum with the vice chair walking in. You make the quorum, my man. Um, Mr. Administrator, we'll start from the top. Thank you so much Thank to you. our uh, federal uh, folks for coming in and our state folks for coming in. Look forward to a very, very in-depth discussion about how we're doing at the federal and the state level when it comes to our efforts to bring resources uh, back to Leon County. Mr. Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, this is your annual workshop on legislative priorities. And as the <coughs> chairman noted, I'm going to hand it off to Andy Johnson, who's our, our, our point staff person on legislative affairs. But as you noted, Mr. Chairman, he's joined by our uh, federal and state teams and Squire Patton Boggs and Capital Alliance Group. So thank you all. And Andy, I will hand it off to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Um, of course, it's a pleasure to be back here again uh, presenting our annual workshop on the state and federal legislative priorities. As the county administrator mentioned, we've got our contract lobbying teams from Squire Patton Boggs and from Capital Alliance Group um, here to join us today. I'll introduce them briefly. We've got Jeff Sharkey, Taylor Beal and Lena, Lena, Juarez. Lena Juarez from Capital Alliance Group, as well as Vicki Cram and um, Sarah Vilms from Squire Patton Boggs. Uh, as you know, our lobbying teams are here to help us um, advocate for the board's uh, appropriations and sp specific policy issues uh, that will be approved here today. Um, and of course, we work with FAC and NACO throughout the year as well on substantive policy issues that affect all counties. Um, and our proposed legislative priorities, as you'll see in today's presentation and your agenda packet, reflect that as well. Uh, so again, we've asked our lobbying teams to join us here today to give us a synopsis of what we anticipate seeing in the Florida legislature, as well as in Congress over the next coming months and, uh, and, uh, and year. You'll hear of each of them in just a moment. Uh, so as a quick bit of an overview of today's workshop, uh, commissioners, I'll be providing an overview of our proposed funding requests as well as our state and federal policy priorities for the coming year. Uh, today, I will touch on basically the highlights of our proposed legislative priorities. Of course, the workshop item before you includes uh, much, much more detail. And as I mentioned, our lobbying team will give us an update on the upcoming uh, state and federal legislative sessions. And as always, commissioners, uh, we'll intend to wrap up our presentation with plenty of time left for board discussion and to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, jumping right into this year's appropriations request, commissioners, as you see on the screen, uh, we're proposing a list of 10 <coughs> projects that you see before you to seek <coughs> legislative funding. Uh, some of these will be familiar to you from recent years. I'll go briefly down the list. Our first two requests are requests for backup generators. You'll, re you'll recall uh, in the last two years we've had a request in for funding for generators for our branch <coughs> libraries and community <coughs> centers, and the intent there is to be able to reopen those facilities as soon as possible following any storm. Uh, you'll see that we've asked added a backup generator request this year for um, the Florida Department of Health facility on Orange Avenue, which is a facility that can serve as a backup special needs shelter um, and to be able to assist Florida High as the primary special needs shelter to reopen as quickly as possible. Moving down the list, the Leon Works Expo and Junior Apprenticeship, of course, this was previously funded by the legislature a couple of years ago in 2016. Um, and of course, we're seeking funding to support next year's expo as well as the Junior Apprenticeship Program. Orchard Pond Greenway Trail has been uh, funded by the legislature in a few years recently. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't made it past the governor's desk, however, so we've got that on the list again. Uh, the next set of projects, Lake Henrietta, Ford's Arm, Centerville Trace, <laughs> Harbinwood Estates, and Fred George Wetland Restoration are water projects. And as you all know, commissioners, the legislature historically has allocated a pot of funding uh, in most recent years uh, for local water Projects. So in anticipation of that funding potentially being available again this year, we've included these projects on our list. Uh, and finally, commissioners, we've included a request for funding to support local reentry programs, and that's consistent with the board direction provided at the se September 24th meeting. Uh, in addition, what's not on the screen, but what is before you in your workshop packets, commissioners, staff is also seeking uh, policy direction from the board to provide support uh, for any of our community partners funding requests that may arise in the area of resiliency, anything that would make our community more re disaster resilient, um, as well as local reentry programs. Programs. We know that we have some community partners that may come forward with some legislative funding requests. So we're seeking the board's direction to go ahead and provide support to those community partners uh, who do submit requests in those areas. 
Uh, moving on, as we've done beginning with last year's workshop, this is a separate and very large list. Again, it's also provided in your workshop packet. You may recall we began last year providing a list of projects for potential grant funding. Uh, and the reason that we've done this is really for two reasons. Number one, to help keep our list of legislative funding requests as concise and as focused as possible, and also to best align these projects with the most likely source of funding. As you'll recall, in several recent years, the governor's office and the legislature um, have directed many local projects toward the existing grant programs offered by the executive branch agencies. Um, but as you know, again, we've been very successful in recent years seeking grant funding for projects uh, in these areas. Uh, for example, we have over $100 million programmed uh, in FDOT's five-year work program for major transportation projects, such as uh, Capital Circle Southwest and Woodville Highway and others. Uh, and in addition, commissioners, just this year, uh, the county entered into a first-of-its-kind agreement with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to fund water quality and springs restoration projects in Leon County over a period of several several years, um, which are also included on this list. And of course, uh, we all know that our parks and greenways are second to none uh, among the best anywhere. So of course, we've got several projects on this list to seek potential grant funding that we feel would also be extremely competitive. Um, so staff recommends that we continue the strategy that we began last year of seeking state and federal grant funding for the projects on this list. Commissioners, moving on to our proposed substantive policy issues for the 2019 session. Um, as you know, some of our policy priorities tend to be annual in nature, things like uh, advocating on behalf of our state workforce, protecting local government's home rule authority, things of that nature. However, this year I want to highlight one of our proposed policy priorities at the state level, which is the high impact tourist development tax that would support a major economic and tourism development project in Leon County. Commissioners, as you know, the county and city have allocated up to $20 million from the Blueprint 2020 sales tax extension to support the construction of the convention center contemplated in FSU's arena district. And last month, most recently, the IA board authorized the commencement of the bond financing process subject to the IA's final approval of the construction and operating plans for the convention center and hotel. So this year, Commissioner staff's recommending, again, a policy priority priority that would allow the county by supermajority vote of the board to levy the local option high impact tourism development tax, which of course could be used to support operating costs of the convention center once constructed. And I will mention that um, the board has included this item in the past in the county's legislative priorities. However, uh, this year FAC is also considering the issue on behalf of all 67 Florida counties. And you may recall at last month's policy conference, FAC's Finance Tax Administration Committee uh, unanimously approved a proposal to allow every county to levy the additional one penny of high impact tourist development tax. That proposal will come back to FAC's full membership in November at the legislative conference. So with the board's approval, we'll of course continue working with our state and federal legislative teams, as well as FAC to advocate for that uh, for Leon County, as well as any other counties that may be included. And with that, commissioners, at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Jeff Sharkey from Capital Alliance Group. Again, I mentioned uh, we'll invite Jeff to provide us a quick overview of what we anticipate in the 2019 Florida legislative session and uh, what we expect to see. Jeff. Great. Commissioners, thank you. Uh, uh, Andy, thank you so much for, for all of the support and hard work you do with Nikki. They, you had a great team here, as I know you know, very diligent, very focused. They keep us on our toes constantly. Uh, well, it's going to be an interesting year. Let me just kind of start with that frame. I know most of you probably haven't noticed there's a campaign season happening. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, so we uh, we are uh, closing in on the on the on the conclusion of that, and of course we've got 120 House members running for for re-election, uh, 35, uh, uh, 15 Senate seats. Uh, so we're going to have a really interesting mix of of potentially new players. We have a new uh, speaker uh, designate who will be taking uh, Jose Oliva from Miami, uh, very focused uh, uh, conservative libertarian for the most part, I think, uh, business person. Uh, Senator Bill Galvano will be the Senate President uh, who um, we have great relationships with both of them, but I think you 'll see a little bit a little different focus uh, from both of those as as this moves forward uh, this year of course uh, you 're all well aware of the, the governor 's race and the u s Senate race and um, uh, what I've suggested to all of them is that they would divert ten percent of the campaign funds to Leon County Leon works. Uh, I think we'd have a five fantastic program. What do you think? That's a great. Um, <clears throat> but just kind of get a kind of key highlights, and then we'll come, come, obviously come back into some of the things that Andy talked about. Uh, 
this hurricane obviously is going to have a huge impact on the way that the legislature addresses what's going on in the panhandle uh, with uh, uh, FEMA reimbursements. Hopefully, we'll move forward, but they will also they'll also fund a lot of infrastructure issues, uh, both in terms of roads, water, sewer, uh, cell tower uh, with private sector uh, cell communications, emergency response capabilities, affordable housing, housing support. Um, we had a pretty uh, remarkable budget last year, <clears throat> $88.7 billion uh, budget, which is, you know, $6 billion more than the previous year. Uh, the revenue estimators were a year ago projecting about a billion one shortfall. Most recently this summer, they've come back and said we've got about a $235 million surplus. But I think that all washes <clears throat> when in the context of, of this hurricane. Uh, and um, we'll see exactly where we end up when they do the revenue estimating uh, when, when the legislator comes back. So after the election, November 6th, uh, we have the first uh, committee meetings, interim committee meetings, organizational meetings in December. And then this year, well, again, the legislature will will start uh, in, the, in, uh, in January, January 7th for interim committee meetings and then move through March and April. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> you know, hopefully some things will change uh, with the new leadership and dynamic in both the House and the Senate. And of course, we have cabinet members as well who are going to be weighing in and we'll see how that plays out in terms of Republicans, Democrats. That could provide an interesting dynamic, of course, to the, to the political dialogue. But um, uh, one of the things we obviously we're very vigilant about in terms of policy issues is this assault on home rule. I mean, Andy's pointed it out. I can list, <clears throat> as we did in our report, uh, post-session report last year, the number of bills filed that really were <clears throat> designed to preempt local governments, cities and counties, whether it's tree trimming, <clears throat> whether it's carrying guns on, you know, in, in, in communities, in, in, in colleges, community redevelopment agencies. I'm not going to go through the list, but it's, 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 uh, it's an onslaught. I think, uh, I don't, my sense is the Senate is certainly has always been a little less inclined to do that. Senator Galvano is, is a much more moderate person with respect to some of those, those issues. Uh, but again, I, I can anticipate that a lot of this kind of stuff that was there last year that didn't pass, and a good proportion of it did not, will be back uh, again this year. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a critical issue. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> you know, our goal obviously is to protect uh, the state's workforce. Uh, I think we've done a reason, I mean, we, but, you know, all the stakeholders, and, and, and I, I do want to just add it, just mention Commissioner Deloge and uh, Commissioner Maddox in your, in your support of that community-wide legislative dialogue that we hold, which I think is very helpful because it really allows us all to share <clears throat> these common ideas, as, as Andy pointed out, in helping them to support uh, those stakeholder legislative requests. Um, so we, you know, we work closely on that, and all of them are committed to protecting the state workforce. I think we've we, we've done a good job of doing that, um, as well as protecting some of the unique natural characteristics uh, and, and community characteristics in Leon County, the canopy roads, uh, our, our quality of life, our state parks, etc. A lot of the appropriations issues that you see here are really. Really go to the heart of of those of those uh, of that part of our our character in Leon County. So, you know, we'll work very diligently on that as well. Um, let me shift to the the um, high impact tourism uh, tax. We're very familiar with that. We've had that conversation for about three years <clears throat> with FSU. I know that the administrator has, has worked hard on this as well. Uh, we're probably at the point now, whether or not other counties do it, where I think we can we can really. Um, um, uh, support and market this to uh, our, our legislative delegation, but also to engage engage uh, the university partners, uh, community partners on the importance of this uh, long run. And I think uh, Senator Monford's been been supportive. Uh, we, we had we had some issues with uh, convincing our our House members <clears throat> that it was a good idea. It's really not a tax increase, and so I think uh, we'll we'll be working hard on that. Uh, from the beginning with Representative Bashirs and Osley and uh, Alexander. Um, again, we're here, we're here to support. I can answer any questions. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. And you're also well aware of, the, uh, of this unique and interesting Constitutional Revision Commission slate of amendments. Uh, we watched uh, that, uh, I think the term is sausage being made 
uh, throughout that process, you know, it's an interesting it's an interesting political dynamic. And as you know, they've bundled a number of these uh, together, and there are a lot of them uh, on the ballot. But a, of course, a couple that are really important to to us and to the community, you know, Amendment One um, on the increased homestead property tax exemption, uh, two and ten all have an impact on us. <clears throat> I think uh, you're probably seeing the same, you know, we get polls, three or four polls a day uh, on political blogs, and uh, it's interesting to note this one, is, Amendment 1 is not trending that well. You know, it's, it's not, it's not, early voting does not indicate that uh, there's a 60% um, uh, margin there. Correct, not trending well. I mean, trending well for us. Yes, yeah, 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 excuse me. So, uh, again, it'll be an interesting election year, and, and uh, come November 7th, we'll see where, when the smoke clears uh, where we stand. But I, I believe that uh, our relationships, Lena and Taylor and I, and work with Andy and Nikki, um, we've got a good rela set of relationships over there, particularly with incoming leadership. And so we're, we're excited about working, again, on Leanne County's behalf. Mr. Chairman, are you allowing questions? Uh, yes. <clears throat> yeah. I just have one quick question, uh, because trees are on my brain right now. And last year when, they, uh, when the legislature was looking into that preemption of local right. ordinances regarding trees and stuff, I guess we could escape it. We could escape it currently, uh, but is that a serious thing? Or is there a lot of zest for that this time? Because it seemed like <clears throat> well, last year it was just sort of a, a trolling, I guess. <laughs> I mean, have you seen anything about that? Yeah, it, 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 it did pass the House last year. Um, it didn't get in the Senate, right? It, yeah, it did not make it in the Senate. It did not pass. <clears throat> the, One of the preemptions. You know, it was kind of, a, it was kind of the, part of the grab bag of home rule issues, it, as all of these are, assault on home rule. <clears throat> Somebody's got a problem in some city, some county, somewhere, and the, and the way they want to address it is to create this general bill that affects everybody. Uh, this one seemed to be remarkably uh, short-sighted. Uh, and, and certainly from, from our perspective, I think, if, should it arise again, I think we need to demonstrate, you know, how important it is that local communities have control over this. So you haven't heard anything about it no. coming back? It's just if it... No, I mean, and, and again, you know, we're, prior to the election, there have been no bills filed. There are bills of what they call bill drafting. Right. But um, I don't, I mean, uh, this, this, the House member response to this bill was a Democrat from, from, from Broward County, which was quite remarkable. Uh, but not a lot of trees in Broward County, maybe. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be able to stop this again this year. Yeah. And, you know, maybe but, but as you think about trees, maybe there is something that, you know, collectively local communities want to do to, to, to as, as Andy pointed out, resiliency and sustainability in some fashion, I don't know if we need the state to help us do that in any way, or maybe it's maybe it's well, funding in some sense. Tomorrow, uh, the <clears throat> Canby Roads Management Plan draft is coming forward for discussion, in addition to all of our resiliency projects we have going on here. So yep. we have a lot to uh, represent our own responsibility in this county and what we're doing. So we'll see. Well, I know it's you know one of the lesser urgent ones. Uh, Commissioner, it will, it will, it will, it's probably maybe not them, but it, is someone doing an, a kind of an assessment of, 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 of kind of those canopy roads and, you know, the, I mean... The, the, yeah, our, uh, the Urban Forester and the Canopy Roads okay. Committee have been working on this for probably six or eight months, uh, had public hearings and so forth to try to talk about not just preservation of canopy roads, right. but management and care right. for them, you know, when things need to come down or be replanted and just maintaining the safety aspects as well. So it's been a really good, robust discussion for good. quite a while, good. taking on more responsibility rather than just saying no to, you know, to disturbing them to keep them healthy. And that's just canopy roads, so that's certainly not regarding throughout our county and all of the resilience efforts that we have been doing, and we will probably be upping the ante on Yes. You know, following these storms. <clears throat> well, I can tell you more about that okay. at your okay. leisure. Thank you. I have Commissioner Deloge, Commissioner Deloge, and Q. Commissioner Deloge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jeff, um, on the stuff that didn't make it to the ballot this year as far as amendments and things like that, that, you know, they've, they've been percolating out there, can you expand a little bit on the things that we're going to start seeing this next year? Can be the ones at the Supreme uh, the Court? Local government specific where they're going to try and curtail us. I'm just kind of curious because there was a lot of crazy proposals last year, but... I'm not sure which ones which ones are on the ballot. 
No, well, I know it's on the ballot, and you address that. I'm going to talk. What are the things that we look forward to this next go around as far as that could didn't get any light of day this last year because it just didn't get any traction, but they're going to bring back? I'm kind of curious. Uh, on <clears throat> in the legislation, not on the ballot. Right. Oh, CRC, I'm sorry. I thought I was yeah. trying to think what, what didn't make it on the CRC. Um, you know, community redevelopment agencies, you know, Senator Lee will be back. Uh, right. That was his deal. He moderated his position over the years, but that was a big one. Um, vacation, rentals. vacation rentals, for sure, will be back. Um, uh, EMS balance billing, maybe another one. <coughs> Correct. <coughs> Correct. That was EMS balance billing, you recall. That was one a um, couple of years ago, I think the last year or yeah. two, they've sought to preempt. Uh, ambulance providers, yes, EMS ambulance providers from um, balance billing, which is basically collecting the balance of a bill that's not paid by um, insurance coverage. But uh, I think a lot of the focus of that issue, a lot of people had consternation about uh, air ambulance bills. Um, there was the Office of Insurance Regulation put together um, a stakeholder committee to, to, to study the issue and did so pretty extensively. And I think they've recently wrapped up that process. Haven't seen any direct recommendations coming out from that recently, but I wouldn't be surprised to see it come back. Yeah, that popped up. It didn't. It didn't go very far last year. We and, our, and the EMS folks came over and did a very good job presenting it. <clears throat> um, you know, there were, there was a bunch of there's a number of bills. I don't want to call them goofy, but but again, picked on some certain things to really to really dig in at the local government uh, officials, right? I mean, what, travel restrictions. If you may remember that one. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah I mean, that hotel, was like you know, <clears throat> let me, let, you know, some things. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, I anticipate. Particularly coming out of the House, uh, there'll be uh, you know a number of um, of those kinds of you know, we you know the state knows better than local governments on how you should run your business. So um, we're certainly and you know I think the, the responsiveness from from the League of Cities <clears throat> from FAC uh, has been has been very good. We you know we know how to respond quickly to these things. Excuse me, I don't know why this is. Um, so. Um, we can anticipate that there will be, you know, some of that coming back. Great, crazy season still. Yeah. yeah. A lot of it's pomp and circumstance. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all, as always. And uh, I think your last phrase there was crazy season. Is that right, Commissioner Dozier? <laughs> um, so I'll take it a slightly different. Things are going to change one way or another. So I'm wondering if, given the late um, start of session this year, the later start, would it be in our interest to come back and do another check-in on the state issues? Federal is just going to keep going as it's going to get to that. But another check on state issues early sure. December or at our January meeting sure. um, to kind of reflect. I'm, I'm particularly thinking, I mean, if, depending on where the governor is, the <coughs> CEO could change dramatically, all the different departments. We, we may need to Correct. kind of reassess. I think it would at. be. I think it's a good idea. Okay. And one, one of the things that I get asked, you know, routinely by, by kind of non-political, non-elected officials is, you know, what's the follow-up, what's the result, consequences of Parkland, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that, that, that group of, of students and their stakeholders is, you know, still very, very active. Uh, oftentimes those things peak and they, you know, they drop off. And, um, but um, depending on who ends up, you know, uh, in, in, in the cabinet leadership, uh, attorney general, governor, obviously, uh, that could that could play a bigger role. As you know, we had, we, I don't know if it was the number count, three or four, uh, you know, NRA-related, mm -hmm. you know, gun control bills. Um, that's certainly much more in the, in, 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 there's, it's not as predictable as it used to be in terms of uh, how people will carry those because there's a very, very vocal and, and, and uh, aggressive, if I may say, um, advocacy group uh, you know, on gun control. Um, so. And Commissioner Doja, I will say also, Jeff mentioned earlier um, about how uh, Hurricane Michael response and recovery and ongoing operations expected <coughs> and handle are going to affect uh, a lot of the tenor of, of what the legislature dives into this year. I know at the um, in your uh, afternoon meeting on the agenda, you've got a comprehensive status report on the agenda of our activities 
leading up to during and after the storm and kind of where we're at right now uh, that the county administrator will present later on. Um, and in that, of course, within 90 days, we're anticipating bringing back an, an after action report to you. And uh, that'll be about January. And at that time, I would envision, especially because right now we're just beginning the process of kind of debriefing all of our partner agencies and things like that. And um, as we've done in the past is digging into finding every possible lesson learned. And around that same time, we'll be also by the, the legislature will have um, picked up its initial committee meetings and things like that. So we anticipate, I know you've got uh, an appropriation request listed on, on our project list this year in this workshop, um, but as we as we really dig into that after action process, we may identify some more things here and there, um, particularly regarding the building code. I'm, I've already seen some discussions about how Hurricane Michael may impact some discussions about the building code throughout the state. So um, in the coming weeks, uh, as we really dig into that after action report, we're going to, uh, I, I expect, identify a lot of additional issues that, of course, we'll bring back to you at that time. Um, I appreciate that, Andy, and certainly... Uh the hurricane itself and anything that happens, federal or state, in uh, disaster appropriations or other action, we're going to need, I know you're going to bring that back mm -hmm. to us. Thinking about just the impact across the board, what is the tenor of DEO, DEP, you know, transportation, those types of things, I just don't want to lose that piece of right. it because we're all going to be hyper focused on the hurricane issues locally and regionally. Right. So, um, um, Mr. Chair, we don't have a motion yet, is that right? Or we, we can wait. We don't, but we haven't heard from discussion. the federal side yet. Forgive me. So of good. course. Um, well, I would like to um, make that suggestion when we get to motions at the end. But, um, we kind of formally request an update maybe in January to wrap in with uh, the hurricane response, and that sounds like the right timing for the after action to look at our legislative priorities in general. But I'll save the motion, of course. Don't want to leave Sarah and Vicki out. Um, the other. Just a couple of questions I had. Um, Jeff, just hearing uh, different comments over the years about legislative report priorities as it relates to infrastructure projects, things that Blueprint or CRTPA might be working on, and making sure that we have our coordination there. Um, I think there's there's been some talk about if we have it in a legislative priority and that's funded, it may um, it may change things at CRTP or, or anything like that. Andy, this can go to you too. I just want to make sure our coordination is in the right posture, that we kind of know what every group is doing all the way through. If Blueprint or CRTPA were to be funded for something and we had it in a legislative request or it may impact the budget for our area, something like that. Am I on the right track with this? You are, Commissioner, and absolutely. That's that's why, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've created kind of that separate list of grant projects, and that's where any of those potential hitches could happen, especially when you've got like a five-year program of uh, transportation projects like FDOT uh, keeps. And I know the state has started to do something similar with water quality springs restoration projects. <clears throat> So that's what we've done starting last year is to create that separate list to make sure that we're not stepping on any toes. If something changes in CRTPA, if something changes in the DOT work program, we're not upsetting the apple cart by putting something um, elsewhere in the order. Um, so yeah, we want to be good partners with uh, FDOT, the district office, and CRTPA, and um, all of the granting agencies in that area. So I think we are we're, we're in good shape there. Okay, great. And he, you know, he he kind of, you know, quarterbacks it pretty intensely, so <clears throat> it keeps us informed of, you know where the priorities are, what's a legislative look, what's a grant look, and then you know, to the extent we can help out and reach out to these agencies um, to assist with that grant uh, support, we do that too. So. Well, that is fantastic. I'm not surprised that you got a good quarterback. Um, we do. Um, I just, personalities will change, other things like that, and we don't want to get two requests in crosswise or something like that. So that's fantastic. Um, the, the last... Um, actually, I'll save the last piece. This, this gets to kind of state and local, but um, Commissioner Village, I was thinking about the committee you had established, the board established, just after we got stimulus funds, um, and that grew into the legislative dialogue. Um, I think the Regional Planning Council is going to look at a, a task force of sorts. Um, the chairman, Randy Merritt, um, is... Uh, talking about that, and we'll bring it up our next board meeting. <clears throat> to make sure we recover as a region, and thinking about how disaster supplement comes down from federal government or from state. I just wondered if there's any lessons learned from how you coordinated with the partners 
to make sure that we are ready to access those dollars when they come down. And I do think ARPC is going to take part of this, but I just wondered if anyone had any thoughts now or later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's it. Thank you all. Mr. Bond, yeah. It, it, I mean, inclu we, we, we included pretty much every public entity within a 50-mile radius, you know, the schools, the counties, the cities, any major institution, you know, uh, TMH was here. We include the chamber. Um, I think we accomplished a lot. I mean, and the, and the ask was pretty easy. Look, you, 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 you solve one of our problems, everybody's lifted. And so if you do, you know, uh, roads in Gadsden County or sewers in Wakala County, everybody wins. And it wasn't quite as competitive. And I think we raised our standard as far as how, how competitive we were. Um, there's been some talk, I know, at fact about not just the recovery side, but the immediate kind of, um, if you notice with Michael, what happened is you have counties around the state that just started sending resources, you know, uh, generators, trucks, line people, all this stuff from all over the state. But it wasn't really, I, I, I had this conversation earlier with a couple of people, it wasn't very well coordinated, I don't think. In fact, would be in a real good position to say, look, every county's got resources that in the event of a disaster, they can marshal. And so we all see these storms coming and we see these events coming and you can kind of prep up and then FAC could help by saying, look, here's the staging ground, here's who's in charge of this part of it, here's who's in part of this. Because what happens is, you know, I talked to the data <coughs> commissioners and she said, you know, we just cut loose a bunch of our people and said, get up there and help. And that's fine and they work through the EOC and try and coordinate it, but I think there's probably a better way to do that. But, you know, there's always, I always laugh because, you know, in government we shouldn't be competitive. I mean, there's no secret here we've all it's all tax dollars and why don't we figure out a better way to work together so anyway that's a good idea yeah. Mr. Chair, one last question here. Um, Commissioner Lewis thank you for that I'm, I'm going to come back to that volunteer and donor coordination when we get to the hurricane report later because I've had some similar thoughts and there's some activities going on for this piece it's more um, timber industry is decimated I bet the oysters are going to have a substantial impact We've got a lot of industries regionally. We are going to get some impact from that. Um, we have evacuees. It's more the economic development, infrastructure, making sure we have access to those funds. So we can continue talking about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, jumping in real quickly, briefly, to our proposed federal priorities, as you see on the screen before you here. Um, a few of these you'll you'll notice that have been priorities in recent years. The foreign trade zone application again, um, the board um, adopted this in last year's priorities to support uh, the city's application for a foreign trade zone at the airport, as well as Amtrak passenger rail restoration. The focus of that being um, primarily. Um, funding the grant programs that uh, that assist with rail restoration, infrastructure restoration along the rail line. Um, but one, I, again, I want to highlight another unique opportunity for Leon County that's included in the priorities this year, uh, and that's the relocation of the um, Department of Agriculture offices. So in August, commissioners, the U.S. Department of Agriculture announced that uh, it intends to relocate two of its offices, which are the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and the Economic Research Service, uh, and they anticipate doing that by next year. So USDA uh, has asked for letters of interest from state and local governments, academia, uh, industry partners, private sector, et cetera. And they've outlined some specific criteria for the ideal community that they'd like to relocate to, which are, are commuting options for employees, proximity to an airport, technology infrastructure, community amenities, quality of life, and workforce. Um, so of course, we feel like Leon County checks all of those boxes and would be uh, an ideal place, an extremely competitive location for these offices. So at this time, staff has prepared and submitted a proposal to USDA. Um, Pat and Boggs, of course, has helped us coordinate support through our federal delegation. Um, but of course, staff is recommending the board uh, provide some policy direction to continue to work with USDA um, to support this proposal uh, and to engage our legislative delegation uh, to support it as well. Um, Secretary Purdue, just as a side note from USDA, ha um, has mentioned that USDA is going to select a location by January uh, and they anticipate the relocation plan for summer 2019. So I wanted to highlight that one as, again, a unique opportunity the same way that we had on the, uh, our state priorities list. This is one for the federal priorities that doesn't happen every year, but one that uh, could be a real game changer for us. So um, with that, moving on, again, I'd like to hand it over to Vicki Cram and Sarah Vilms from uh, Squire Patton Boggs to give us an overview of what we expect in the coming months in Congress. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, so as you may know, we are from Squire Patton Boggs in Washington, D.C. We represent the county before the federal government, before the White House, the federal agencies and before Congress. 
Um, we are glad to be back in Leon County and seeing all of you. And, and it's been a thrill, and it's always great to work with Andy Johnson. So I want to thank him for his, his work and dedication. I am Sarah Vilms. Um, I'm a senior policy advisor at Squire Patent Boggs. I'm here with my colleague, Licky, Vicky, <laughs> Vicky Cram, uh, who is the co-chair of our local government's practice group. Um, we also have a larger group back at the firm that supports us and supports Leon County that you don't see here. Uh, we're going to speak to four areas today as to how they impact the county. Um, we're going to discuss the current federal budget and the appropriations and what that means to the county. Um, and Vicki's also going to talk a little bit about some significant legislation that was passed this past <coughs> Congress. Uh, we'll also talk about the fall and the remainder of this year and what we anticipate Congress getting done before 2019 and what that means for the county. Um, we're also going to look at what we can expect for the 116th count, uh, Congress um, and also how that impacts the county. And finally, we're going to touch on uh, what we can expect as far as outcomes for the midterm elections and what they, that may mean for the county as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Vicki to start with number one. We're going to tag team here on, on a couple of these, but why don't you take it away? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here today and a pleasure to work with Andy and Nikki, who are a great team, um, and we really, we really appreciate all the support they give us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit. Congress is currently adjourned uh, for the elections, and we'll come back after after the elections, um, when they'll be back in D.C. for a lame duck session to wrap up mainly federal spending, but some other issues. This year, Congress vowed to return to the, the FY19 appropriations process to regular order, uh, and with some success, so that's good to note. Um, both chambers passed all 12 of their spending bills out of uh, committee, and at the time of adjournment, Congress had approved its second minibus, FY19 minibus, where they package bills together to move them through the process at the very end. Um, so the second minibus was defense, and then also the bill that um, governs the departments of labor, HHS, and education. Those two bills are about 70% of the federal government spending. Um, and then they tacked on to that a continuing resolution until December 7th to fund the re remainder of the federal government uh, in federal fiscal year having begun on October 1st. Um, and the president had already signed into law the first minibus, which was the energy and water bill, the military construction and VA bill, and the legislative branch appropriations bills. So the five remaining bills, agriculture, com commerce, justice, science is one bill, financial services, homeland security, interior and environment, again, one bill, and transportation HUD, again, one bill, for many of our more significant programs like CDBG block grant and home and a lot of other tiger grants now called BUILD. Um, are in that. So they were all held up over disputes over the border wall and also um, some contentious policy riders that were contained in the House version of the bills. The Senate pretty much tried to keep their bills clean without policy riders. So how these bills are resolved will depend largely in some measure to um, the outcome of the elections. Uh, complicating the lame duck negotiations is that passage of the Labor HHS bill and the defense bill, because those are often used as leverage by Democrats and Republicans, respectively, to move the rest of the packages forward. Um, we've been keeping the county apprised of all notable acti activities related to the movement of the 12 appropriations bills throughout the process, including uh, a frequently updated chart of all programmatic funding levels of interest to local governments. Programs of interest to the county, like CWG, the Home Program, the BUILD Program, which was formerly the Tiger Transportation Program, all fared fairly well in the process, although we don't know what some of those final numbers are, due to the budget agreement that added at the beginning of the year some additional domestic discretionary funding. We anticipate, at this point, pretty much level funding for most programs going into this federal fiscal year. Um, there's also talk of in the lame duck session, to your point, Commissioner Dozier, um, of putting a disaster aid funding package onto the remaining appropriations bills as they move forward for areas hit by Hurricane Michael. Um, so how the lame duck plays out is going to be 
questionable, it's hard to, hard to predict. The president keeps threatening and has all year long to shut down the federal government over border wall funding. Uh, and he may try to do that in the lame duck. Uh, he wants $5 billion for the wall. The House package has $5 billion. The Senate package has $1.5 um, But in just the last couple of days, as the race for the new speaker in the House has heated up, because, of course, Speaker Ryan is stepping down, Congressman Kevin McCarthy, who's currently the majority leader in the House um, and will be running for speaker, uh, has introduced a $23 billion spending package to build the wall. And there is some thinking that they may try to move it through the process called reconciliation, which is the process that brought us um, the Affordable Care Act, also the process that brought us, brought us the tax cut bill. Um, and that process allows for expedited passage of certain budgetary legislation um, on spending with a simple majority vote so you bypass the filibuster system. So with the House expected to flip to Democratic control next year, uh, and Sarah will talk about this more when we get to that, um, this could be potentially the last chance for border wall funding, so um, with or without an immigration package attached. And um, so it might have implications on the remainder of these spending bills that have not even been passed by Congress. <coughs> so that's all sort of where it is right now. It's hard to predict, absent knowing what the election will bring us. Um, Congress also uh, has some notable accomplishments, um, particularly two infrastructure bills that they passed. One was the Federal Aviation Administration reauthorization. After years and years of short-term extensions, the President signed a five-year, $90 billion authorization. That marks the longest FAA reauthorization passed since the 1980s. And it addressed industry workforce programs, aviation safety, and drone integration. It did not include the privatization of the air traffic control system, which was something that had been holding it up for a while. Congress also sent a reauthorization of the Water Resources Development Act that governs all Army Corps of Engineers projects to the White House for the President's signature. He has not yet signed it. Um, this, is, this sort of provides funding for projects port, waterway, flood control, other water resources. Um, but other elements of the bill included directing the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to expedite projects for flood risk management or hurricane and storm damage reduction in a number of states of which Florida is one. Um, legislation also reauthorizes the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, the WIFIA program, which is a federal loan program for very large water and sewer projects. Um, and it also included some drinking water system improvements, including grants for um, resilient infrastructure, not a lot of money authorized, but some res for construction design, planning, implementation of resilient infrastructure, um, funding for identifying lead and drinking water at schools and daycare centers, um, and then additional money for, it's only $100 million, but it's, you know, it all adds up. Um, to eight areas that have received a major federal disaster declaration since January 1, 2017, to help repair their drinking water systems specifically. Um, and then also of interest to the county has been passage of a very, very large, comprehensive, bicameral, bi bipartisan uh, opioid legislation. There were 50 bills in the House. Um, and we've been reporting on them as they've been moving through. Uh, and then the Senate combined all those 50 bills into one very large um, package to address the nation's opioid epidemic. And it um, largely modifies Medicare and Medicaid policies uh, and other elements seek to expand comprehensive substance abuse disorder, disorder treatment, particularly with state and local communities and community centers, establishment of community centers to address opioids. Um, so that's, there's still some must-pass bills to, to be considered during the lame duck. I will pass it over to my colleague Sarah to talk on those, and that's the first part of our report that she was talking about. So the second part is um, we there are six real big items that uh, we expect Congress to address between now and the remainder of the year. Um, Number one is the appropriations bills that Vicki referred to that will expire by December. The ones that are operating on a continuing resolution will expire by December 7th, so they have to pass those. Um, the second important thing is, especially to Leon County, is the National Flood Insurance Program, which will expire November 30th. Right now, well, even before Hurricane Michael, that 
program was about $20 billion in debt. It will be even more strained after um, they look at the damage from Hurricane Michael. One of the preeminent issues that they're debating in that is how much the federal government should pay for insurance versus how much should be privately funded by private insurance. That debate will result in impacting people who live in floodplains. Um, whether they see their insurance go up or stay the same will be decided based on that outcome. Uh, the third area that the federal government's going to attack um, between now and the end of the years, and, and it will be covered under the appropriations, is, is the PILT and the SRS funding, which also impacts Leon County. PILT is, as you may remember me talking about this in years past, is the payment in lieu of taxes. That is, um, the federal government pays Leon County for lands that are federal within side the Leon County's border that Leon County cannot develop and, and therefore receive taxable income. So this is land such as is the Appalachian National Co National Forest, Appalachian Coal and National Forest, that's within the county's boundaries. Um, the county typically receives somewhere between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars a year from that program. Uh, that program used to be a mandatory program until recently. And now it's discretionarily funded by Congress, which we lobby for hard every year. Um, this year it has five hundred million in both the House and Senate um, appropriations bills for FY19, which we expect to hold during the conference. So that's looking good. Um, the Secure Rural Schools program is a similar program, but operates differently. Um, we lobbied hard for its reauthors, its recent short-term reauthorization, which we got two years for, FY17 and FY18. Um, that continues to be a mandatory program if it's reauthorized. Um, and that also is, has about $256 million in the whole program for each year. And that goes to about 700 counties throughout the United States, one of which is Leon County. Um, both PILT and SRS need a long-term fix. Um, they, the problem is Congress has to find an offset, which hasn't been found yet. We, are un, we understand that Senator Wyden will possibly offer a permanent solution to the reauthorization of the SRS for next year. Um, this is a commitment, and both, this is, Democrats and, and Republicans are committed to both of these programs because it affects so much of counties. Um, so we will be staying in the game on, on both of those next year um, heavily as we have been in the past. Uh, number The fourth program we look at Congress to be addressing, well, not addressing between now and, and the end of the year is infrastructure. We don't expect anything to happen on that until the 116th Congress. And Vicki's going to talk about that um, next uh, because we do expect some big movement there. So I'm going to wait and she can t tell you the rest about that. The fifth area that we expect Congress to address between now and the end of the year is the Farm Bill. Um, as you may know, the House and Senate are at play in resolving differences right now. Their House has offered some significant work requirements for SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, that would be would require able-bodied single recipients to either work or enroll in job training programs. Um, the House also, the House bill also <clears throat> makes it harder for states to expand income eligibility for those SNAP recipients, for SNAP recipients, for additional SNAP recipients. The Senate version of the Farm Bill does not largely include most of these revisions to SNAP. Um, the House version also cuts about $5 billion in conservation programs for farmers. So there's a lot of controversy and they've been going back and forth, but they have, we see that as another one that they must resolve before January 1. Uh, the, the sixth and final area that we, we think that they will pass uh, before Congress leaves is um, the public lands package. This could possibly include a permanent reauthorization of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which will which has expired. It expired at the end of September, but that provides hundreds of millions of dollars for acquisition and maintenance of public lands, um, and that is funded by royalties from oil and gas development. Um, but that is for things like national parks, such as the national national and national forests, such as the national Apalachicola forest, national wildlife refugees, other protected areas. Um, the other piece of this large land public lands package we expect is the Restore Our Parks um, public lands bill, which would provide about 1.3 billion to pay for the backlog for the National Park Service. Um, as you've probably seen, that's been in the, in the federal news a lot. And lastly, 
It's a little bit of a wild card. This is a kind of a seventh area that we look at Congress. Depending on the election outcomes in the midterms, there could be more movement of legacy programs that retiring Republicans want to get done, that Democrats may work with them on, or vice versa. Um, and it all depends on the out outcome of the elections, and we'll, we'll touch a little bit about that next, uh, after, later. Um, but I'm going to turn back to Vicki so she can talk about what we can expect for the 116th Congress, which will take place in January. So again, I'm gazing into my crystal ball, not knowing what the outcome of the election is, so don't hold this against me. Um, but um, we do think that, to, you know, of course, budget and appropriations, always an ongoing issue, always a battle. The deficit has increased by 17 percent from this time last year. Uh, and so there's going to be an effort to try to rein in some some funds and spending, um, and Congress needs to raise the debt ceiling again next year, which always triggers a lot of angst and um, anxiety and is used as a political pawn between the parties. Um, we think particularly if the House slips to Democratic control, um, that surface transportation will, will become, you know, having passed the FAA bill and the Army Corps bill, two infrastructure packages, now surface transportation has its moment, roads, bridges, highways. Um, Congressman DeFazio of Oregon will be the, hold the gavel at the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and he's interested in really addressing the solvency of the Highway Trust Fund, which is a huge issue, as you all are more than well aware, um, and investing in surface transportation. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about raising the gas tax, indexing the gas tax, uh, transitioning the gas tax over to a vehicle mile, vehicle miles traveled tax. I think all of that is going to be in play. Congressman DePazio has been in favor of indexing the gas tax for a period of time and then maybe transitioning to a different mechanism for gathering taxes. So um, we will see how this goes. Um, the president just recently said he'd be willing to work with Democrats on, a, on an infrastructure bill, but how you pay for it has always been the problem with this. Um, the other thing you're going to see, especially if the House will, if the House takes the, the uh, is taken by the Democrats, is investigations, 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 whether it's into environmental rollbacks that the administration has proposed um, or, or corruption in the government, whatever, it's, um, that's going to be something that we're going to be spending a lot of time on next year Congresses. Um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has talked about Medicare and Medicaid um, reform as a way to um, sort of try to curb the ballooning deficits. Uh, and so that'll get a little traction with the House if the House flips and becomes Democratic. It'll get more traction with the House if they remain in Republican control, depending, of course, on what the you know, what the spread is between the two. Um, I think immigration and DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, still will be very much on people's minds, particularly if the Democrats take the House. Um, the Deferred, the DACA program, um, set off a slew of lawsuits attempting to stop the Department of Homeland Security from terminating the initiative. Um, and much of that litigation has been successful and has resulted in DHS still accepting DACA renewals. Um, but that will be something that I think people will want to look to and address. And whether the wall gets, gets handled in the lame duck or not, the wall is always, of course, the sort of negotiating chip we give you the wall if you, if you extend DACA. Um, and then there may be uh, some additional tax legislation in the next Congress. Either um, certainly probably a technical corrections bill to correct just, you know, the colons and the dotted I's and everything in the big tax cut bill. Um, but also uh, tax extenders, which are tax provisions that run out periodically. You know, they're extended for three years and then they run out and they have to be renewed. Um, and then there's also the idea of tax 2.0, which would be making permanent um, the tax cuts for individuals if both chambers are held by Republicans. Um, and then, of course, most recently, we've been hearing a lot about middle class tax cuts. The president has said just recently that it's going to happen in the lame duck session. I, that surprised Congress. Um, so I think next year that may be something that people may want to look at. Um, so that it'll be an interesting year, and we will be on top of it all and feeding the information to you and looking for opportunities for the county. And I'll turn it back over to Sarah.
So our, for our last topic, um, we're going to just touch on what we expect for outcomes for the midterm elections um, and what's likely to happen and how that impacts Leon County. Uh, as you probably know, in the Senate, depending on how you count it, it is about 24 to 26 Dems that are up for election, nine Republicans, um, assuming the two independents caucus with the Dems. Uh, there is uh, the prediction is if this if the Dems were to retake the Senate, they would have to run the table. They'd have to retain every seat they have and plus pick up two or three. That is not likely, we think, for any party. Um, so the predictions are technically, if that did happen, it would be 51D, 49R. You could also get a 50-50 Senate where Vice President Pence would break the balance, um, which would mean the Republican-led lean Republican -led Senate, as well as a 52 to 48 Republican-led uh, Senate. So those are kind of the three predictions. Um, let's talk a little bit briefly about Florida-specific. Um, you have two sitting senators, one of each party, that are currently and would be very well positioned to serve the county's needs in the 116th Congress. Um, this is just in, and Commissioner uh, Daly, this corrects some of the information I gave you this morning. Uh, Bill Nelson, is, Senator Bill Nelson, has been taken out of the toss-up category and moved to the likely, likely Dem. Um, yet there is a second, the poll says Nelson is at 50, 47 percent and Scott is at 49 percent. So Nelson trails by negative two. Um, so, you know, we have two weeks to go before the election and that could change a lot of things. Things are tightening. So that kind of continues to fluctuate on an almost moment by moment basis. Uh, but Senator Nelson, um, should he win, he is the um, he he would likely retain his his seat as the leading Democrat, the ranking majority member, ranking minority member, excuse me, on the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee. That's important for the county because that committee controls all highways, roads, buses, trucks, oceans, coast guard, outer continental shelf lands, deep water ports, and fisheries. Um, he also serve, He's also likely to stay on aging. Obviously important to anyone in, in Florida as, as many Ooh. retirees locate here. Um, he's He would likely retain his seat on finance, which governs important programs um, for health under the Social Security Act, as well as health programs financed um, by specific tax, such as those through the Affordable Care Act. Um, and that also deals with, that committee also deals with tariffs and, and um, import quotas. And he'd also likely retain his seat on armed services. If Rick Scott wins, he will lo likely lose the seniority that Senator Nelson has, as Rick Scott would become a freshman, um, and freshmen, as you may know, typically serve as the lowest ranking spots on committees. So Leon County would, would lose some of that seniority of, of um, Senator Nelson that he currently retains. The big news um, for, for Senator Marco Rubio is that if the Senate does hold its uh, majority, Senator Marco Rubio is likely to become the chairman of the Small Business Committee. Um, that um, he would also retain his, likely retain his seats on foreign relations, uh, aging, appropriations, and the intelligence committees. On, on the appropriations, he serves on many different subcommittees, um, agriculture, interior and environment, labor, health and human services, um, military construction, and, and VA, which is responsible for the funding for the um, National Cemetery here in Leon County, um, state and foreign ops, and on ag, that would that is significant in, um, influence over the farm bill. Um, so let's switch to the House real quickly. Uh, we assume that the Democrats would take the majority. There's approximately a 70 percent chance for the Democrats um, to take that ma majority. Um, the big news for Leon County there is should um, Representative Neil Dunn retain his seat in the heated race against former Leon County Board Chairman or bo Board of Commissioner and Chairman at one point in time, Bob Ratcliffe, um, and the House flips. Representative Dunn will be in the minority with Representative Lawson in the majority. Obviously, if Bob Ratcliffe wins, you would have two set, two House rep representatives in the majority, as well as potentially one, well, one senator on the Senate side in the majority from Marco Rubio. Um, so let's talk about Representative Lawson for a second. He would be in the majority. He would continue to serve on his two committees, Committee on Agriculture, which again, he could um, <coughs> serve with Chairman, tag team with, um, sorry, Senator Marco Rubio on the 
farm bill, which is important in those negotiations. And Senator uh, Representative Lawson, Lawson also would serve, continue to serve in his role on in the Committee on Small Business. He could also tag team with Rubio on that if they can likely work across party lines to support Florida-specific policies, which we do see from time to time when people come from a, a similar state together to work on those same similar uh, committees. Uh, Representative Dunn would be relegated to the minority. Um, he would likely continue on his committees on Committee on Ag, Agriculture, Committee on Science and Space and Technology, and Committee on Veteran Affairs. If uh, Bob Ratcliffe were to win, it's anyone's guess as to what he would want to serve on and what, what he would be allowed to serve on, what they might give him. Um, we also see if the, this is sort of rumor right now, if the Republicans retain both the House and the Senate, they will likely close up shop almost immediately and kick the legislation that they have on uh, at the forefront now to the 116th. If the Democrats win the House, they're likely to stay in and try and work with some of the legacy retiring Republicans to get something passed between now and before the end of the year. But we are happy to take questions if that's useful. I have Commissioner Pratt and Q to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Sarah. A uh, question was asked at the debate the other night. Uh, since the next governor of Florida wants the president impeached, uh, how would that governor be able to work with the executive branch? you have any idea? Sorry, if you said if the, if the current government were to be impeached, how would the, the next government work? Is, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question clearly. When Andrew Gillum becomes the governor <coughs> yes. of Florida, he has stated that the current president should be impeached. Mm -hmm. His opponent suggested that because he has called for an impeachment of the president, that he would be very ineffective in securing resources from um, Washington. Uh, what is your take on that? You know, I think, and Vicki, you chime in, uh, I think impeachment has been floated around by, you know, any one flavor, not just the Democrats, but also some of the Republicans. The, the situation you have is even if you were to impeach the current president, you have Vice President Pence, who is, you know, similar or even to the right on many of the issues that, that the um, president currently has. You know, because impeachment has been floated and, and sort of dismissed or, or um, considered, I don't think it, it matters either way. Vicki, do you? Well, let me say it, say it yeah. another way. Is Florida going to lose in Washington with a Democratic governor? Can I say it that way? I don't think so. Depending on uh, it, right now, it looks like, as we said, 70 percent of the House flips. So you have a, a 70 percent chance the House flips. So I think that as a Democratic governor, you work your priorities through the House and to get and the Senate stays really very tight. So I don't think that would hurt you. I think the other factor is that Florida is is always going to be a a, a, a purpley state in some regards. So you know, I think you're going to no matter who is president, they are going to want to invest in Florida um, for their own party's sake, whether it's Democrat, Democrat or Republican. Okay. I um, was on the elevator coming up, and the assistant county administrator, uh, Miss Hunter, and I. And uh, bumped into a family, uh, family that I know, and they were just leaving court. And they wanted to know how could they get mental health services for their um, 20, 22 year old son. And um, they said that their child had been in and out of court, but he keeps committing the wrong crimes, and they can't secure help for him. And he's only committing misdemeanors. But in order for him to get um, uh, state um, help, he needs to go ahead and commit a felony before he can be put into Chattahoochee. So short of uh, this kid's need to commit a felony to secure uh, court-ordered help, and I have a son in a similar situation category, there is no mid-level in our area uh, for mental health treatment and uh, there's no elasticity in our system none and we have no midpoints and I did not hear from 
either the state report, the federal report. Uh, I've not read anything dealing with mental health. And I'm curious as to here in Tallahassee, our Leon County Jail is our largest mental health facility. And uh, I read this week that depression is beginning to set in among some people in the uh, panhandle who have experienced or in the aftermath of the storm. And in terms of their psyche, uh, that it, most people are spiraling downward with depression. What does it require um, from the state government or the, our federal government that we're able to secure uh, designated support for mental health, and particularly in a the north part of Florida, which a kid has to commit a felony in order to get into uh, a state hospital. Well, I'll take a first cut, but some yeah. of it might. Do you want to go first? Cause well, um, uh, Commissioner, you, you probably remember post Parkland shooting, the legislature's response in large part was addressing quote unquote mental health issues in, in public schools, as well as school hardening, you know, arming teachers, et cetera, a variety of other things. So, so. To your point, there has been, has been, and I'll, I can get the actual numbers, some additional funding for mental health counselors, mental health services for for, for uh, schools, public schools, K-12. He's 22. I understand. It's about, that the next point was uh, we work uh, closely with um, the managing entity here in Leon, in, in the PAM handle from here to Jacksonville on mental health, behavioral health issues, and, you know, funded through the um, uh, uh, Department of Children and Family. Uh, they did. They did receive a little bump. They have a contracted three-year contracted period. Uh, it's on the top of the. You know, it's certainly on the top of the agenda. It's still prevalent there. But to your point, um, a lot of talk about it. Uh, other than what was funded in public schools, um, not much else came out of DCF. Okay. And it continue. You know, it continues to be a big issue. And you're right. Uh, the county jails are are now the predominant mental health providers, unless you end up at Appalachia. You know, through some. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I understand we're getting close to the meeting here. Um, good update. Thank you yeah. very much. Um, thinking about US um, DA, I love that proposal. Um, the Southeast Regional Archaeological Center is here in town. So we have one regional headquarters for a federal agency here. Um, they are tenants at Innovation Park. They have worked closely. They supported a recent grant application um, from Innovation Park. If that is helpful at all, Andy Serviki, um, I, I think we've got, I just wanted to raise that up because we've got a great relationship and there may be something we can point to there to help back up that application. Does that sound appropriate? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. I think David Morgan would, would be willing to do that if he can. Sure. Um, the, um, I had one general question, and we can get more information about this later, Mr. Chair, if you want to keep moving. But when I looked at the list of grants, um, they were all state-based grants. So I'm kind of wondering where we are on the federal side. And um, something I've heard over the years, and I think there is an example with, again, Innovation Park, meeting with the EDA um, Economic Development Administration February of 15, I can draw a direct line from that to our positioning for the recent grant for the incubator. So I think getting in front of these folks early on in the process does have some benefit, and I would love to hear more about that as we go, particularly as things start to change with the House or others. If there are opportunities to start getting ahead of some of these funding requests, I just that that was a nice example, and I've been reflecting on how much um, that conversation in 15 before we even had a project really helped us. So, Ms. County Administrator, I'm gonna look to you on that as well. If we can get more on that, um, I'd like to. Um, and lastly, this is um, I think there's reentry money there too, Andy. There's a federal grant for that. Um, this is not on the list, but I'm very curious if we can get more information as it goes. We are one of a majority states now, I guess, that has uh, medical marijuana or some type of decriminalization, legalization, however you want to couch that. I believe there's a case going to maybe the Arizona Supreme Court right now, um, somebody who had it legally in the state but is being charged under federal law. 
And I've heard various things through the year about DOJ and the Attorney General and maybe there's legislation or things like that. I think we need to protect our folks um, in the state, certainly. Um, if it's legal here constitutionally, just want to watch where that's coming. So if there's any information as we go, I, I just think that's, that's something we need to keep an eye on, particularly if people in other states are being charged with a crime, even though it's legal in the state. Is that right? And, and we track this very closely for other clients, which are in states that either have medical and or um, recreational med marijuana. So we'll make sure that we start sending you that information that we share. With Fantastic. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Daly. Thank you. On a personal note, I just want to say it's been a pleasure working with the legislative team, both on the federal and on the state level. I don't know if you've had a chance to meet Commissioner-elect Rick Miner, who's sitting right behind you, and I look forward to making that introduction. But it's been a pleasure, and you all do a tremendous job, and thank you very much. You. Mr. Chairman, do you have a motion? I don't, but I have a question before you present that motion. Um, Sarah. Could you talk about a little bit about the opportunity that we spoke of in my office a few minutes ago in, in terms of housing and the grant program that you were telling me about? Uh, Mr. Administrator Board, uh, as you know, my, my interest in, in public housing and affordable housing and how we can go about uh, moving the needle on, on, on replacing the, the public housing that we have here in Leon County. We've moved the ball in Orange Avenue, but um, my heart is really also in moving the ball on Springfield and, and the Joe Lewis neighborhood as well. And so when I was in my briefing, I had a conversation with our, with our federal uh, lobbying group. They told me about a grant opportunity that I'd like for them to share with the board and county administrator. And I'd like for if the board would allow for us to start the process of working with the city if, to see if we can't uh, apply for this grant. It's very competitive. There's only about five given out in the nation. But, I mean, I would rather try than not. Uh, to put that effort towards towards getting, I think, the people who live in those communities rely on us to take these kind of chances for them. So if you could just speak a little bit about it uh, in, in probably less than seven minutes, tell us a little bit about, you know, the process that you would uh, suggest that we go through to uh, try to apply for it. Sure, sure, sure. And Vicki and I can tag team on this because we both had experience in this area. So what the commission, the chairman is referring to is the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has a program called the Choice Neighborhoods Grant. They, it has been historically between 20 and $30 million. Um, as he rightly uh, suggested, they only give out about five a year. It's very highly competitive. Um, we've had success in obtaining that um, grant for the city of uh, San Antonio in Texas and the city of San Diego in California. Um, it is a, basically a year-long process. We expect the application to come out this spring. And um, I think Chairman Maddox has pointed out one of the things that we, we have done or we did with both of those cities is we brought U.S. agency officials down to the state to see the project and see what was going on and get them familiar with it. Um, they also came to Washington to lobby on it. Um, it, it, it would be a, a full-on commitment with, with Leon County and, and possibly a partner um, being the city of Tallahassee. But um, I think what Chairman Maddox has shown with what they've done in or in, at Orange Avenue and they could show what they want to do for Springfield would be highly influ influential. Um, it would just be, you know, a commitment to, to say we want to lobby for this and we, we want to commit to getting the letters of support and doing the visits and having the agencies down. Uh, Vicki, what do you, you add? It's actually New Orleans. Oh, it was New Orleans. It was New Orleans. Sorry. Um, that's okay. It was my mistake earlier. Oh, okay. Um, it's a multi-year process, typically, because typically you get a planning grant yes. initially. But that is funded. Mm -hmm. The planning that grant is, is funded. funded. And then after the planning grant has been completed, you go back to the federal government for an implementation grant, which is the 20 to $25 million grant. And it's transformative for a neighborhood. Um, and so it's something we're happy to work with you on. And I promise to get you information. We'll get that as to how the grant works and you know whether it would be applicable for the area you're thinking about. Oh, and talk a little bit about it's an it's an entire neighborhood program. It's not just for one public housing unit, and it, it it's not about public housing. It's really about reforming the neighborhood. Do you you know can you get the housing right? Can you get the transportation right? Do they need a bus stop? Do they need healthcare clinics? Do they need a VA uh, facility? You, you know, it's sort of 
a, a real, as Vicki pointed to, alluded to, it's entirely transformational for the entire neighborhood, not just public housing, but public housing is a real centerpiece of all that. So my, my thought is, is that what we're doing with Orange Avenue and Purpose Built, this would, this this grant application would be uh, a good pair with it to look at the rest of the neighborhood infrastructurally and stuff like that. So. Um, I think it increases our our, our chances uh, at getting it with us already taking the steps that we're taking with Orange Avenue, and every cent every cent counts uh, when it comes to trying to get these things done. Uh, yeah, my my original thought was uh, Springfield, but you know we're much further along on Orange Avenue, and I think that would probably be the best opportunity we have to obtain the grant. Uh, my thought with was with the city is that because it is within the city, we will have to work with them on. On, on the application, and so um, if the board would be okay with it, I would like to start the process of working with our federal staff, having the county administrator reach out to the uh, city manager to see uh, if we can get this thing coordinated to see if we could apply for this money and and, and possibly have it come to Leon County to improve uh, the Orange Avenue neighborhood. Uh, and thank you so much for doing that for me. Commissioner Daly, you wanted to offer a motion? I'll make a motion for staff recommendation uh, as amended uh, by the chairman. Is there a second? Sorry. Commissioner Doge, I'd also ask that we include uh, oh. update in January for I, state labs. Of course. I apologize. Thank I, you. As, as both amendments are made to the motion. Uh, motion made by Commissioner Daly, seconded by uh, Commissioner Lindley. Commissioner Doge, you got something? No, sir. Okay. All those in favor of the motion on the floor indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We will uh, recess until 3 o'clock for our regular meeting. Thank you.